All right, students, this is the final video for topic, uh, topic 9.1, Simple Harmonic Motion Higher Level. And I'm going to talk about energy in Simple Harmonic Motion. Now, if you've taken a look at your data booklet uh, for topic 9, there's lots and lots of equations that look fairly complicated, okay? Um, we've obviously gone through all the trigonometric functions, um, sine, cosine, depending on where uh, an oscillating object is at t equals zero. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about um, the concept of energy in simple harmonic motion. And in order to do this, we need to sort of remember what we what is meant by potential energy and um, kinetic energy. Those are really the only two kinds of energy that we're going to consider here, all right? Now, if you consider the case of a horizontal spring, uh, a frictionless tabletop, okay, um, that spring has, um, or th that mass has basically two different kinds of energy associated with it. One of its, one of it, its energy is the kinetic energy, which is one half mv squared, and we're going to call this E sub k. The other has to do with the um, elastic potential energy stored in the spring, and we saw before that elastic potential energy is one half kx squared. Okay, now because um, because k um, is m times omega squared, uh, as we talked about before, we can also express that as one half m omega squared x squared, where omega is, as it was before, 2 pi over the period, okay? So therefore, the total energy of the system, if you remember back when we studied gravitational potential or gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy, we said the total energy of a falling object was the sum of those two. Similarly, in this case, we're going to call the total energy E sub t as um, the kinetic energy plus the elastic potential energy, and it's going to be something like this. Now, look how similar these equations appear, all right? Now, if we're assuming that energy is conserved and a frictionless tabletop, which is obviously unrealistic, but that's how that's a simplifying assumption that we make, um, then the energy is constant. And if it's released from rest when x equals a, okay, for example, so it's going to be released from this particular situation right here where it's pulled out in a positive direction, then 1 half kx squared plus 1 half mv squared is going to equal 1 half ka squared, right? Because initially, initially, this is all the energy that it has, right? Okay? All right. So if I solve for v, then I get this equation that I actually alluded to in the last video with that example when I said I'm going to explain that particular equation in the next video. Well, here it is, and this is actually given to you in the data booklet, okay? And again, don't forget that the maximum velocity of this um, oscillating mass is omega times a, okay? And that maximum velocity occurs when its displacement is zero as usual, okay? So you're not going to have to derive this uh, this equation, but um, you want to make sure that you know how to use it, okay? Okay, so again, considering the horizontal spring mass system, okay, we have this equation for V and this equation for the kinetic energy, okay, and um, kinetic energy, well, if I just square this term, I also get another version of kinetic energy as 1 half m omega squared times the quantity a squared minus x squared. Now, the maximum kinetic energy um, occurs at the bottom of its swing or at its maximum um, displacement, right? <clears throat> so, or sorry, minimum displacement. So, this is also the total energy of the system, okay? The total energy, uh, you want to really simplify things and you want to think about how the mathematics models um, sort of something happening in real life. Now, the IB data booklet gives you these three equations right here, okay? So you see that all of these equations are different versions of what I've done here with just the variables shown slightly differently. Again, notice their use of x naught. Um, instead of my use of A, I still think that capital A makes more sense because that's the amplitude and X naught um, basically suggests that that's the position, that that's the value of X at T equals zero, which it's not always, okay? Um, but just make sure that you can use all these equations as given to you by, by the IB in your data booklet, okay? Okay, now if we want to graph the energies involved in simple harmonic motion, remember uh, with, with a pendulum, it's a constantly give and take between the kinetic and the potential where the total energy stays the same, okay? We've seen this graph before and played around with the, with the FET simulation, all right? Now, if I want to graph um, the kinetic energy, all right, as a function of time, 
it's a sinusoidal function. It looks sinusoidal, but it never goes negative because kinetic energy can never be negative because it's a V squared term, right? Okay. And in this case, I have that uh, V of T is negative V max times the sine omega T. So the graph of the kinetic energy against time is the sine squared uh sine squared curve, okay, because of this, one half mv squared, and if I put v of t in for that v, uh, v squared, it's a sine squared curve, okay? Now, in, in the IB, you don't necessarily, uh, you don't necessarily need to deal with the mathematics of, of knowing that it's a sine squared curve, but you should be able to qualitatively um, look at graphs and make graphs of, um, of energies of things in simple harmonic motion. Now, for a pendulum, the, the, the potential energy is also um, always positive, right? Starts off at a maximum and goes to zero like that. Okay. Now, since the elastic potential energy or the potential energy in general, okay, not just for springs, masses on springs, but also for pendulums, okay, turns out it's a cosine squared term uh, curve. Okay. It looks like that. So the only difference between a sine and a sine squared is that the sine squared is a little bit, uh, it's narrower, right? And same with the cosine, all right? If I graph them both together, I get this really cool graph right here. And do you guys remember the, um, the trig identity that the cosine squared uh, plus the sine squared is 1? Well, that, that's a, actually um, a statement of the conservation of energy in this case, all right? So pretty, pretty cool stuff, pretty mathematical. You're not going to have to derive this stuff, but I'm just showing to you how these are squared curves, uh, trig, trig functions squared, okay? All right. Try this example on your own before I do it for you. Okay, so the graph shows the variation with the square of the displacement, x squared, of the potential energy of a particle of mass 40 grams that is executing simple harmonic motion. Using the graph, determine the period of oscillation of the particle. This is an example of what you will have to do uh, in this class, okay? Now, um, Probably you sense that the slope of the line will be important, okay? Now, this is E, the potential energy graphed against x squared. So obviously the slope of the line is going to be all this junk right here, right? Okay, and the slope of the line is 200 joules per, uh, 200 joules per square meter, okay? All right, then all you do is you just um, extract capital T, or the period of oscillation, out of that, out of that slope and you get that it's um, 0 0.063 seconds, okay? So that's how we would use these equations to deduce some physical information from the mathematical models, okay? All right, try this one, okay? Particle of mass, uh, half a kilogram, undergoes simple harmonic motion. So I'm giving you the angular frequency and the amplitude. Determine V max, okay? Well, I'm using a cosine term here, and Notice how whenever I solve these problems, I always actually, just to be safe, and this is because this is how I learned it when I went to university, I always include um, I always include a phase shift here. Even though I often don't use it, I just, out, out of habit, I always do that, okay? So displacement, velocity, okay? Vmax occurs knowing physically what's going on when the displacement is zero, okay? All right, so I set phi equal to zero, and I use equation number one, right, which is... Uh, which was my trusty old equation for when it's going through um, when it's going through equilibrium. Okay, so from one, I get that uh, I solve for t using the inverse cosine function, 0.175 seconds, um, and then I just find v by plugging in that time, and I get that it's 0.27 meters per second. And um, that's the question is asking the maximum speed, not the maximum velocity. Okay. Um, so you want to take the absolute value because that's what they're asking right here, okay? Okay, again, uh, find V and A, the velocity or the speed and the acceleration under these conditions and when it's moving towards the equilibrium position at three centimeters and the total energy of the motion, okay? So you're gonna to need to pause the video and probably work these out and spend a couple of minutes working them, okay? Okay, so in this case, I got that, um, that when the displacement is at 1.5 centimeters, that's at a time of 0.116 seconds. Um, the speed at this at this time is 0.22 meters per second. Okay. Now the acceleration then 
would be 1.22 meters per second squared. So make sure that you can follow my rationale with the mathematics. The total energy, okay, there's a couple of different ways to do this. I think the easiest way is to just do the 1 half m omega squared s max squared, and I got that it's 0 0.018 joules, which is not a lot of energy, um, but, um, you know, this is a fairly small object that's, um, that has an angular frequency that's actually not that high. Okay, so it's point, um, so it's um, 18 uh, millijoules, okay? Okay, I want to talk a little bit about energy loss in simple harmonic motion. You're not responsible for, for having to explain and derive sort of different types of damping, okay? But I just, but I have to mention that friction is, of course, always present. Therefore, the amplitude will reduce over time, eventually um, stopping the motion. And the energy lost is lost as thermal energy to the environment and the system itself. So damped oscillations would look something like this. You have kind of this envelope where it's kind of getting thinner and thinner as time goes by. Okay, A um, couple of physical examples, a pendulum. Notice that the amplitude goes essentially to zero after time. And we can do the same thing, and you can do these simulations in the FET, in the FET software. Um, you can actually adjust the amount of friction, and uh, you can adjust the amount of damping that takes place. Um, but you see, for example, these oscillations go to zero, and so did the pendulums. Okay? Okay. Here's a past paper question that I want to work through again. I think we've referred to this one before, but we're going to do it again. And we're going to add in the concept of energy here, okay? So go ahead and read this to remind yourself what we were talking about. Okay, so we're talking about a methane molecule. And actually, interestingly, this question um, has to do with climate change and um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, which we will study later. But in this case, it's the simple model of a methane molecule where you have a hydrogen and a carbon atom, uh, and they can be regarded as two masses attached by a spring. So the way that atoms move <clears throat> when they're in molecules, it's actually simple harmonic motion, the way that they're always jiggling back and forth with respect to one, one another. It turns out that the hydrogen is much less massive than the carbon. Uh, you should know that, even if you're not taking chemistry such that any displacement of the carbon atom can be ignored. The graph shows the variation with time t of the displacement x from its equilibrium position. Okay, okay. the mass of a hydrogen atom is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Using data from the graph above, determine the amplitude of its oscillation. Well, this is very simple. All you do is you just read the maximum value um, on the y-axis, and I got that it's clearly 1.5 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. Don't forget that you have this power of 10 associated there uh, with your units. That's really important, okay? Okay, all right. Uh, show that the frequency of its oscillation is 9.1 times 10 to the 13 hertz, okay? Well, all you do here is you need to figure out what the period is uh, from the graph, right? <clears throat> and the frequency is one over that. So you see, you, you know, these the questions that we ask you um, are really fairly basic. You're not going to have to derive any crazy stuff, okay? Part C, show that the maximum kinetic energy is 6.2 times 10 to the minus 8. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to do here is I need to, I'm going to have to find the maximum, um, the maximum speed, okay? And then what I can do is I can just put that, and this is one way to do it. This is not the only way. I put the maximum speed into my 1 half mv squared, and I got that it's 6.2 times 10 to the minus 18 joules, okay? All right, another example dealing directly with energy, okay? <clears throat> this graph shows how the kinetic energy of a mass on a spring varies with the displacement x of the particle from equilibrium. Using the axes, or the graph in other words, sketch a graph to show how the potential energy varies with the displacement x. Interesting. So this is the kinetic energy. Show how the potential energy varies. This is the kind of qualitative question that you will have to have to answer. Okay. Well, if you remember back to the um, the problems that we did where we graphed the kinetic and gravitational potential of an ar of an object that's falling, um, say in free fall from the edge of a cliff, it wouldn't surprise you that the potential energy would be something like that. Remember that. Um, adding them both together equals 1, or it's a constant because sine squared plus so cosine squared equals 1, okay? In part B, it's a little more quantitative. The mass of the particle is uh, 300 grams. Use data from the graph to show that the frequency of oscillation is 2 hertz, okay? Now, in this case, <coughs> you find that the... Um, 
you find that Vmax, you can get this value of Vmax. And again, this is not the only way to do the problem. There's probably other ways to do it. Okay. And then what you would do um, is you could, this is one way to do it. You could solve for omega and then extract F out of that omega to get that it's two hertz. Okay. And that's how you do these kinds of problems.